Hey, good morning, everyone. So my apologies. I got to get my ears working here. I've lost them. We're creation, suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry. Then from north to south and east to west, we'd hear Christ be magnified. For the whole earth, we're the whole echoing his imminence. His name would burst from seas, from rivers to the mountains. We hear Christ be magnified. Christ be magnified. 
Father, that really is our desire. We have come to recognize without any question that this life is not about us, but it's about you. And we pray that in our words, our actions, even in our worship today, that you'd be glorified. God, we desire to hear from you. We desperately need to hear from you. And so we pray as we worship that you'd speak and we would hear. Thank you, Father. Thank you for meeting us in this place. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I'm so glad to see you this morning. I want to welcome you to chapel. A couple of quick things. We don't make a lot of announcements, but we have two very important events that are about to happen. September the 28th is Serve Day. If you haven't heard about it, you definitely will be hearing more about it. It's an opportunity when we as an entire community go into our city. We're canceling classes on September the 28th in the afternoon, and we're going to be going into a host of different opportunities from helping those who are living on the street to going to nursing homes to doing prayer walk and evangelism. And we want you to begin now to sign up for those opportunities. There's going to be a lunch that's provided as well for all of you who are going. So it'll be a full day on September 28th. We want you to put that on your calendar. We have a very, a very important opportunity that's coming up this week. On Thursday morning at 645 for the ladies on our campus, there is a together prayer event. And I want to encourage all of you ladies and guys, if you are married, we want to encourage you to help your wife do whatever's necessary with the kids so that they can come be a part of this. It is at 645 in Landrum Dining Hall. It is for the ladies here on campus, a together prayer event. We're excited about that. You'll be out in plenty of time to be able to get to class. I'm excited about today. I'm so thankful that Dr. Wilson is here, my dean. I'm thankful for him as he comes and shares with us what God has laid on his heart. He is the dean of Level College. He is also one who is known as a person who is on mission. He's not here just talking about it. He is living it out. And we're so thankful for that. That actually makes me even want to listen more carefully and more attentively to what God's saying through him today. One of the things that uh, Greg did this summer is he took a group of our students on mission to Malaysia. And he also took his family. And one of the things that everybody has talked about is it has been so refreshing to see a family on mission. So I want you to listen as Abby shares with us from her heart about what it means to be a family on mission. So my family moved to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia when my boys were three, almost two and six months old. And it, Kuala Lumpur is a major city. It's a very big city with millions of people. It's, it's very much sprawling like Atlanta, big buildings that are just spread out, and we lived downtown. Um, so our days, a lot of the times, looked like um, going out, going down our elevator, and we'd just start walking the streets. Um, sometimes we'd get on a train. And, um, sometimes we had a particular location that we were headed, and sometimes we just were out touring because what we did overseas was, uh, our desire was to um, share the gospel, um, create friendships, um, meet new people, and, and pray to God that we would be able to um, connect with them and not just connect with them um, on a general level, but on a spiritual level. That was tough. It was tough to be a young mom with young children living overseas. Um, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. I love that it exposed not just me and Greg to other cultures and other peoples and other religions, um, but it opened up my own children, my boys, to other people's cultures and religions. Um, and it's allowed us to broaden our worldview uh, of everything. And um, I think what I love the most is that who we are as a family has become so ingrained into them. Uh, who we are is a family that loves Jesus and a family that desires to see other people love Jesus as well. Um, they get it, my kids get it now. And so even they'll come home from school and they'll tell me about their day and then they'll tell me about a particular kid in class and then they'll say, but they don't know Jesus, and I tried to tell them about Jesus. My kids are getting it, and that is what means the world to me, is that my kids 
can see that ministry doesn't just belong to mom and dad. It belongs to them as well, and they can own it. And so doing ministry together, missions together um, overseas can also be just as special here in our city, in New Orleans. We can do ministry together. If you're called to go overseas, be courageous. Do it, and do it with, with the joy that God has given you, um, knowing that He has called you to do it. And if you're not called to go overseas, but you're called here in your city, be courageous. Go and be courageous. Uh, walk out of your door, walk out of these gates, and be courageous and make missions your way. Well, good morning, guys. I just want to say thank you. I had a little bit of a personal technical issue at the beginning of that last song. And so I want to say thank you, though, for letting me to be here, letting me be here with you to lead today. My name is Mike Haight, and uh, I serve Broadmoor Baptist Church in Madison, Mississippi. I've been there almost 15 years and uh, love being here with you guys this morning. I just want to remind us that we have gathered to worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There's none like him. And so, God, as we enter this place this morning, we just acknowledge your worth. And as we sing praises to you, God, would you be pleased with our hearts? Be exalted in this place. We love you. You're so good. You're so faithful. Thank you for the opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me invite you to stand as we continue to worship.
Just remember God's faithfulness. Do you remember his goodness to you? The grace that he showed. And give him thanks today. God, there is none like you.
No matter what storms may be a part of our lives right now, no matter what circumstances we're walking through, you are a rock and you have everything that we need. So God, this morning we pray that you would speak to us as we open your word. May our hearts be soft. May you shape us and mold us. Make us attentive to what you'd say to us today. We love you. God, we love you. We pray these things in the name above every other name, the name of Jesus, and everyone said, amen. You can be seated. Wow, what a powerful time of worship. Nate, I just want to say thank you, brother, for your leadership there, helping all this to take place. Uh, just really grateful for you, brother, and all the hard work that you do to uh, give us um, incredible times of worship, man. So it's just awesome. Dr. Strong, thank you for the uh, invitation. Love you as well. Very grateful for you. And Dr. Dew, uh, just love you. I'm just, I'm just glad I get to roll with you. I mean, that's just awesome. I'm just grateful for it. Uh, open up your Bibles to Romans 15. Romans 15. So that's what we're going to be looking at. We're going to look at a, a passage of Scripture there in Romans chapter 15. Uh, I want to start off by 
Uh, well, I got to say this, though. That is probably the most beautiful woman I have ever seen on planet Earth. In fact, it is the most beautiful woman I've ever seen on planet Earth with that video. So, man, I liked it. Anybody else like that video? I mean, I, that, whew, wow, it was amazing. So, I hadn't seen it until right now. Um, I want to start off by just simply asking two questions, okay? Two questions as we kind of dive uh, into this particular passage of Scripture, and I want to talk about this subject of ambition. So that's what we're going to be focusing in on. So question number one for every single person here is, what are your current ambitions? We have students here, we have faculty, we have staff, we have guests. What are your current ambitions in life? And then secondly, the question that I also want to pose to every single person here is, should we as Christians, have any shared ambitions? So what are your current ambitions? And then secondly, should we as Christians have any shared ambitions? You guys see it? If you've talked to me, you understand. I am obsessed with Malaysia. I love it. I have an ambition. I really am convinced everyone needs to visit Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. That's my ambition. That's my personal ambition. I think that it is a game changer when you go to that country. In fact, I'll take it even a step further. I've got special friends. Dr. Matthias has an invited through the Global Mission Center. We've got special friends, Jess and Wendy Jennings that are here. I've got an ambition that I take it even to another step. Jess, you agree with me on this, that I have this ambition that everybody should go and visit that entire neck of the world, especially you students through Nehemiah teams. It's an unbelievable unbelievable game changer. You should be doing that. This is my ambition. Should it also be something that should be your ambition as well? I was a student. I was sitting in chapel services just like you guys right now, and I was exposed to my favorite missionary, C.T. Studd. You guys also know that I talk a lot about C.T. Studd. I've named one of my kids, in essence, in honor of him, C.T. Studd, and he said, some wish to live within the sound of church or chapel bell, I desire to build a rescue mission within a yard of hell. Oh, I like that one. I've got an ambition for that. I really believe that we should exist to be the kind of people that are within a yard of hell proclaiming the good news. But the question I want to pose to every single one of us, and I don't want anybody to be excluded from this right now, is just simply this. Should my ambition also be your ambition? Should it be our ambition? What of the Christian faith should we share collectively with regard to ambition? That's why if there's a title of my message today, it's just simply this. Should Paul's ambition be our ambition? Should Paul's ambition be our ambition? Just take a look real quick as we go to this particular text. And I'm going to read right here Romans 15 beginning with verse 14. And it says this. I myself is, am satisfied about you and my brothers that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. This is the verse I want us to focus on this morning. It's just simply this. And thus, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ has already has not already been named lest i build on someone else's foundation so this is god's word in many ways you should look and perceive the book of romans as a missionary support letter if you keep on uh, keep on reading in romans 15 and look at verse 23 and 24 go ahead and look there it says that paul no longer has any work for himself in the regions he's been, and he now wants to go to Spain. 
And he wants to stop on the way in Rome and visit the church there. Romans 15, it's important to connect the dots back to Romans 1. Feel free to take a look at Romans 1. Because we're going to see within Romans 1 the logic behind his ambition in verse 20 of chapter 15. He talks about in chapter 1, verses 13 through 15, about his ministry to the Gentiles. His obligation to Greeks and barbarians. That is why he is eager to preach in Rome. This is when he nails down this pretty awesome moment of Romans 1.16, saying that the gospel is salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew and also the Greek. And then we get to that famous verse as well, Romans 1 verse 20, where he begins to talk about the reality that everyone, there is no one who is without excuse. People are without excuse. So the logic here is just simply this. If Paul is obligated to the Greeks and the barbarians, if salvation is for everyone, and if people are without excuse, then Romans 15 verse 20. A little bit earlier in Romans chapter 15 and verse 9, it says this, that Paul says, so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. And then you go through verses 9 through 12 in chapter 15, Gentiles, Gentiles, Gentiles. In verse 16 of Romans 15, he talks about him being a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, that the Gentiles may be an acceptable offering. He has already said this statement that we read that he believes that he's fully, in a sense, proclaimed the gospel of Christ from Jerusalem to Illyricum. That's a bold assertion to make, but this is why then again he says, thus I make it my ambition. Paul's very clear and very obvious about his ambition, and it's to advance the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles. So let's consider Paul's ambition by taking a look at just three particular quick points, just real quick. Point number one is just simply this. Paul had ambition. Ambition's one of those funny things, right? Ambition for me has gotten me in trouble many a days because I can be overzealous, I can be overly passionate, I can be overly ambitious. So there's so much to ambition, but Paul did, according to verse 20, he have ambition. So with all the subtleties with regard to ambition, let me just highlight three aspects of ambition. First of all, ambition is pretty much having a determination for a not yet fulfilled future. Did you hear that? When you have ambition in your life, it's a determination for a not yet fulfilled future. Some of you are single. I'm ambitious to get married. Right? Some of you, you don't have money. You don't have stability. You are ambitious to get some money, to have some stability. Some of you are ambitious towards a career. If you don't have that yet, ambition simply means a determination for a not yet fulfilled future. Paul had this ambition. Paul had this ambition because he knows God wants the Gentiles for himself. He looks around, he sees they're not yet in the fold, and he goes to work, determined to bring to fruition a not yet fulfilled future. Second aspect of ambition is also this. It's not just necessarily pertaining to the future, but a having ambition can also be a discontent for the present status quo. Some of you right now might be saying, I'm lonely. Some of you might be saying, I'm broke. I'm unhealthy. Some of you might be saying all of these different things, even right before chapel, there might be some of you saying, I am hungry. And as a result of it, you have an ambition in a sense right now because you're upset with the present status quo, and you can't wait to go to the cafeteria and to put some food into your bellies. Paul had this ambition. He knew certain places and certain people already knew about Jesus. But he also knew that in his present day, in that moment for him, there were so many that did not yet know. 
You see, ambition relates to a not yet fulfilled future, upset with the present status quo, but more importantly, ambition really pertains to the fact that it necessitates action for it to actually matter. What's motivated you for a not yet realized future, for an upset with the present status quo, is actually understanding that you have ambition and that you need to do something about it. The important part of ambition is that without action, it's useless. It's absolutely useless. It's empty words. It's exhausting rhetoric. And I don't know about you, but I'm exhausted by the majority of the rhetoric that is taking place through the churches right now. Paul had ambition... And he had to do something about it. Paul had ambition. Secondly, though, we need to see really what his ambition was about. Secondly, we just see, first of all, from Romans 15, 20, that Paul's ambition was to preach the gospel. That's what he was ambitious for. For Christians everywhere, guys, not just here in New Orleans, there is significant consensus within the church that all of us should be ambitious to preach the gospel. Amen? Can I get an amen to that? Okay, just making sure. There's major consensus here. For Christians everywhere, I believe, there's significant consensus within the scriptures that Christians exist to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Preaching the gospel, yes, is the aim of every believer. Preaching the gospel, proclaiming the good news that though we are sinners, God sent Jesus to redeem us from our sins and that if we repent of our sins and place our faith and trust in him, we will have life abundance and we will have life eternal. On this, should Paul's ambition be our ambition to preach the gospel? 100% yes. But let's get to the crux of the matter, okay? Let's do it. Because this is the third point right here. We recognize in verse 20 that Paul's ambition was to preach the gospel where Christ has not yet been named. You see, he is ambitious to preach the gospel where Christ has not yet been named because he was so plugged in to God's ambition. You remember that ambition is a determination for a not yet fulfilled future. And I love Revelation 7, 9, and 10, right? After this, I looked and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, and people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and they cried out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. A vision of a not yet fulfilled future future drove Paul and he was ambitious for it he was militantly loyal to it because God my brothers and sisters in Christ desires for himself an incredibly large worshiping complete family from every nation tribe people and language and this is where Paul comes in and he says yep that's my ambition You remember another interesting aspect of ambition is that it is a discontent for the present status quo. According to IMB's annual statistic report that we just received at the annual meeting, there are 12,116 unique people groups in the world. And as of right now, 59% of the world's population is unreached. That is 4.6 billion people right now on planet Earth that are without the gospel and access to it. 
In fact, if you want to have something even more daunting, just recognize that the IMB helped us to see, actually, that there are 173,451 lost people who die every day. Two people per second. Ambition is to have a discontent with the present status quo. Paul had that. He had this holy discontent. But most importantly, he had an ambition that was met with action. You see, because an interesting aspect of ambition is that it necessitates action for it to matter. Paul was determined to do whatever it took to complete or to do everything in his power at least to make his ambition matter. Which is why he wrote to Rome, which is why he wanted to get with them, which is why he wanted to continue on to Spain. So I want to conclude by just simply bringing it to us. I just want us to think about this. Because I'm a little crazy when it comes to some of these things. I get it. I had a really intense moment in class today, didn't I, Bailey? And I apologized about that. It was, you got to come and ask me a little bit later. But I felt like rather intense in my global issues and trends class today. And, you know, we had a fun moment there, me and Bailey did and the rest of the class. Why do I have an ambition here? Why should Malaysia even care, bother? What in the world? Malaysia, we're here in New Orleans, Louisiana. Why in the world should we even have places like Malaysia or Morocco where the earthquake happened or Libya where the floods are just taking place? Why should we even care about such places? You all saw a picture of my children, my family, right? Do they have more right to the gospel than the sons of Malaysia? Do they have more right to the gospel than the daughters of Malaysia? I want to just simply close by saying this. What are your current ambitions? If you were able to fill out this particular statement, not sharing it with anybody else, but simply just saying this, my ambitions are, or my ambition is, what would it be? I would hope here, I would hope that here we would have some variation. There's wonderful subtleties that can take place. But ultimately, each of you would say some sort of iteration of whatever God wants. Whatever God wants. He's God. We're not. He's Savior. We're sinners. They're lost. He's the only hope. My hope and my prayer is that every one of us, through our studies, through our times together where we have fun and fellowship out into the city, amongst our churches, everything like that, I pray that we would have this ambition, just like Paul, to do what God wants. So in a sense, and I'm open for conversation, should our ambition <laughs> be Paul's ambition? Romans 15, 20, you better believe it. What are you and I going to do about it? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we don't have the answers. We don't know exactly all the ins and outs, but we're asking that you would call us out and convict us to make sure that it's not necessarily just aligning with Paul's ambition, which is pretty awesome. But Lord, if there's anything that we, we could do right now is that we would... We would surrender ourselves to your ambition, God. Your love is far significant, far more incredible than all of 
our love combined, and you so loved the world that you gave your one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Help us, dear Lord, to align our ambition with yours because there are people all over that just need to know you in whom is life abundant and life eternal. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.